Hey, Bio30. Um, okay, so we're going to do part two of um, our Mendelian genetics uh, dihybrid cross video here. So our last video ended with the summary of the dihybrid cross. And we talked about how if you had um, a heterozygous cross with a heterozygous, uh, which isn't this, sorry, but if we had a heterozygous with a heterozygous, it'd be a large 16 by 16 square. Anything smaller than that, and you can have a much smaller square. Um, today, now we're going to talk about lethal alleles. So the um, extension of this topic, we're still talking about uh, two, two genes, so it's still a dihybrid cross, but instead of having one gene code for a trait, for example, being tall versus short, and then another gene coding for a trait, for example, color, yellow versus green, um, what if that second trait um, in one of its combinations genotypically, so for example, maybe the, the hetero, the, the homozygous dominant version or the homozygous recessive version, what if it, instead of um, causing a certain color to show, what if it killed the organism? Like what if it, sh when you show that genotype, the phenotype was death? And that happens. It's called a lethal allele. So if you show that allelic genotype, it, it's going to die. That organism will die. Or it's not going to survive past a certain length of time due to the mutation or the, the physical portrayal, the phenotypic portrayal of that allele. So here's an example. Um, uh, let's say I've got um, hair color on these Mexican hairless or hair... I think they're dogs. I actually have no clue. I should have Googled that first, but oh well. We'll pretend they're dogs. Um, and so I've got my uh, H allele. We'll say that's for hair. So if it has the little H, the recessive little H, it's going to be considered a, uh, a wild type. The normal wild type uh, has hair. If it doesn't have hair, we're going to call that the mutation, and it's a big H, the letter big H. So um, remember, the, the dominant trait doesn't always have to be the normal trait. Dominant traits are more common, usually, right? But the recessive trait could be the normal. So in this case, the little h is the normal. As soon as you see that the recessive trait is a normal, you got to be asking some questions because normally the recessive trait shouldn't be the most common in a population unless something's funky, something funky is going on with that dominant big H allele. And in this case, we'll see that, yeah, it actually kills people because look at this. The dog that has the big H, big H alleles as their genotype, so homozygous dominant for the H, big H, um, it's the lethal phenotype. So the phenotype of that genotype is death. Um, the heterozygous, one big H allele and one little H allele, well, you show the big H, it's the dominant trait because it's still a capital letter. It's going to be a hairless um, dog. If you have a little h, little h, that's the wild type gene, it's recessive, um, and you're hairy. So a hairy dog is going to have a little h, little h genotype. The Mexican hairless dog is going to have the big h, little h, heterozygous genotype. But as soon as you have a homozygous dominant for the big h, boom, the organism dies. Um, and so uh, here's a good example of a cross. Let's say you crossed a heterozygous uh, hairless with a heterozygous hair less, so these two are hair less. Um, this guy here dies right off. The big H, big H, it's going to die. Uh, but only if it's homozygous dominant for both big H's. Not just one big H that kills it, because look here, as long as you have one big H and a little H, like these two, you're just considered a hairless uh, cat or dog, whatever this is, dog, we'll say. Um, and then one of those three is also going to be the hairy wild type, right? Little H, little H. But as soon as you have that big H, big H in this organism, according to this gene, this legend, it's going to die. It's considered a lethal allele. Um, you could cross them again here. This picture has them crossing again. What if we took a haired dog and crossed it with a hairless dog? Uh, what would the genotypes and phenotypes be of its offspring? Well, two of the four are going to be heterozygous and hairless, and two of the four are going to be homozygous recessive hairy. Nobody in there has two big H's. So all of those four offspring survive, um, which is important to consider. So the dominant allele in this case is lethal. And yes, I was totally right. They're dogs. Um, so 
there's the hairy dude and there's the hairless dude. Hairless is considered the um, dominant uh, allele of the trait. Um, but if you have two big H's, you die. So, um, lethal genes, just a little bit about them. They were first discovered by um, this buddy that was basically looking at coat color in mice. He thought that if he crossed uh, a heterozygous big Y, little Y mouse with another heterozygous big Y, little Y mouse, like the cross you see on the right here, um, he thought he would see a three yellow to one white because he's like, well, there's only one option where they're not going to have a big Y in them. So I should always see three phenotypically yellow and then one of every four should be white, typically based on probability. Um, he never saw that. In fact, he saw a consistent ratio of two to one. So he was like, well, what's going on? Um, so he did a test cross to figure out, right, what's the genotype of my organism that is showing the phenotypic dominant trait. Um, so remember, for test crosses, quick review here, we always do a test cross with a um, homozygous recessive individual. So he performed the test cross and he found that um, uh, even though yellow coat was supposed to be the dominant trait, there was never any homozygous yellow mice. And so he realized that every time genotypically you, a mouse had the big Y, big Y homozygous dominant yellow colored trait, um, they died. And so, of course, you're never going to see an organism that has that genotype if they die like early, early on in embryonic stage because they'll never be born, right? So the only mice that were born were either yellow but heterozygous for the yellow color. So these two, this one here and this one here, or it was uh, not yellow. Um, white and so that was the recessive for both traits but you never saw homozygous dominant because it died and therefore he's like oh oh there's something called a lethal allele and this is a great example of one um, in humans we have lethal alleles too um, so uh, achondroplasia is a genetic condition which causes dwarfism so dwarfism in humans is a, uh, a genetic condition and what happens is if you are heterozygous for the um, dwarfism trait or allele, uh, you will have, uh, you will exhibit a phenotypically um, shorter stature and everything that comes along with dwarfism. Um, but if you had two alleles, like, so if you were... Uh, if you had both alleles for dwarfism, you would die. And so that's what we're trying to say here. As the accumulation of two mutant alleles is lethal, the results in, which would result in the zygote not forming, you would die off. So you can, all, you can only be, if, you're, if you have dwarfism, you can only have the genotype capital letter, lowercase letter. You have to be heterozygous. Because if you had capital, capital letter, you would have died early, early, early on in development during your zygote stage. So very similar to what we just saw with these mice here. Um, and so, uh, that in terms of, um, lethal alleles is, uh, important to recognize. A totally separate, uh, trait distinguish that I want to talk to you about here is that, uh, we've got something called gene interaction and we want to talk about polygenic inheritance. So switching gears here, no more lethal alleles. That's something I want you to know. Now we're talking about polygenic inheritance. So break it down, right? Poly, many, genic, genes, inheritance. So many genes being inherited. Well, what we're trying to say is that two or more genes affect one trait. So what if I had literally uh, two or more separate genes which affected the outcome or phenotype or genotype of another trait? Um, and there's two types of polygenic inheritance. Epistasis. Uh, and complementary interaction. So we'll work one by one here. Um, polygenic inheritance is responsible for traits like any trait where you see a sliding scale of phenotypes, chances are it's a polygenic trait. It's inherited polygenically, which means that there's more than one, or I should say more than two, two or more, um, gene that's affecting the phenotypic portrayal of that trait, skin color, right? You're not just uh, dark-skinned, light-skinned, uh, or 
one or of the other, you could be any any color in between, right? Of skin color and eye color. You don't just have brown eyes or blue eyes or green eyes, right? We talked about this in class, right? You can have hazel eyes, you can have green gray eyes, you can have blue gray eyes, you can have blue green eyes, you can have any combination of them. Height, you're not just tall or short. It's not like you're either six foot or you're five foot two, okay? You're not just one of the two. You could be anywhere from like uh, six foot six basketball player all the way down to Yoda, right? You're two foot nothing, right? You could be anywhere in that height range. There's more than one trait that's affecting, uh, sorry, more than one gene that's affecting that trait for height or eye color or skin color or whatever trait you want to think of. More commonly than you think, many traits are polygenic. Um, it's not as simple as we've made it. So uh, that's uh, polygenic inheritance in the big picture. Uh, let's start with epistasis, and then we'll move on to complementary interaction. So epistasis, or in other words, epistatic interaction, is when you have a gene that masks or covers the expression, the phenotypic expression of another gene. So you've got a trait, but you've got this other gene that's going to block the expression of that trait um, in certain circumstances. And so let's take a look. Really good example, coat color in dogs. Okay, let's say uh, I've got some dogs. I've got uh, one option. If I have the big B allele for coat color, I'm black. If I have the little B allele for coat color, I'm brown or chocolate colored. Um, and then I have a totally separate gene the E allele on a totally separate gene. Um, and that's going to be big E, allows for the color of the trait black or chocolate to show, or little e, which is going to prevent the other trait, so B, big B, little b, from showing. Okay, so one gene, one set of alleles for color, big B or little b, black or chocolate, totally separate gene, with its own alleles, E, so big E allows the color and little e prevents the color. Remember, we're looking at dihybrid crosses, two totally separate genes interacting uh, uh, with two separate traits. But in this case, with epistatic interaction, that second trait is actually affecting the first trait in that dihybrid cross. So let's just uh, do a cross here. So um, if big E, right, is a separate gene on a separate chromosome, little e is going to mask the effect of the b colored gene okay so if it masks it it prevents the color of, b, of the b so it's either black colored or it's chocolate colored um and if it covers it it's going to be yellow or lack of black or chocolate and so let's take a look here uh this cross here let's just go one by one i'll walk you through it big b big b big e big e well remember it the big E allele allows color. So whatever the B colored gene is expressing is allowed. So in this case, it was big B, big B, B big B coded for black, coat color, that dog's gonna be black because the epistatic E gene allowed the color because it was only the big E allele. Same with this one here, right? Um, black coat color for gene one, Gene number two is the epistatic gene, and in this case, it's got the big E. So remember, just like any other trait, if you have a dominant and a recessive, it's considered heterozygous, you're a carrier for the epistatic little e gene, but you don't show it. You're going to express the big E allele. That's the phenotype you express, and big E expresses, in this case, allowing the coat color. So the coat color is big B, big B, so black you're allowed these dogs are black but let's look at this third one over here to the right big b big b so it's got the coat color for black it should be a black dog but then you look at the second gene on the second trait in this case it's that epistatic gene and there's no big e there it's all lowercase e's it's homozygous recessive lowercase e little e little e well little e prevents coat color so if by preventing the coat color which is in this case black I'm going to be yellow because I wasn't allowing black. It's got to be some color, so it's yellow. Lack of black is yellow in this case for these dogs. Um, we could do the same thing down here, right? Heterozygous for the B, so it's still a black dog, even though it's a carrier for the, the chocolate or brown colored coat. Um, still going to be black. 
and it's homozygous dominant for the epistatic allowing color gene, so black dog. This one in the middle, um, heterozygous for both traits, doesn't have uh, just two little e's, so it's going to allow coat color because it's got the big E, so it's going to be black. This dog on the right hand side, uh, heterozygous for the coat color, but still going to show black if the second trait lets it. But if we look up here, the second gene, the epistatic gene, was literally, literally. It will not allow that dog to be black. It's going to be yellow. Prevents the color of gene number one from showing. Um, down here, little b, little b, just a brown dog, right? Little b, little b, brown gene said b's are going to be, lowercase b's are the chocolate color, brown color, and then big b is the black color. This happens to be homozygous recessive for coat color, so it's brown. Epistatic gene, that second gene, had only big E, so it allows coat color, so it's a brown dog. Same here. You got the big E. We're allowing the other gene to show it's going to be a brown dog. For this guy on the bottom right here, though, he's a brown dog, but because the second gene on a separate chromosome happens to be epistatic, and it's little e, little e, which is the only way you can get the prevent coat color phenotype, it's going to prevent the coat color. So literally, literally, this dog is not considered brown. These are the brown dogs. This, this dog is going to have the epistatic gene block the color gene. And so it's going to come out as a yellow. Um, give this a shot. Pause the video here if you'd like. Um, and then we'll get going here. So pause the video. Try it. What's the phenotype of these guys, these three dogs? And so what you should have found is that this dog, big E, little e, big B, little b, well, big B is black, so it's going to show a black color if the epistatic gene lets In this case, it's got a big E. According to my legend, it should allow color. It should be a black dog. And there we go, black dog. Um, the second one here, though, um, it should be a black dog. Right, the carrier for the brown allele, but who cares? It's a brown. It's a, sorry, it's a black dog, but it's homozygous recessive for that epistatic trait. According to our legend, that's going to block the color black, so it should be a yellow uh, dog. There you go. Yellow dog is our phenotype. This guy down here should be a brown dog. Um, the epistatic gene is the dominant trait there, so it's not going to cover our color. This is going to be a brown dog. So there you go. You got your four little puppies in front of you here, and you could predict um, which one's got which genotype based off of what we just talked about. Uh, another good example here, right? As soon as you have a little e, little e, you're going to be colorless or yellow no matter what. It doesn't matter if you should have shown brown or you should have shown black. It's going to trump the epistatic gene, trumps the other genes phenotype, whatever it is. In this case, we're talking about coat color and dogs. It could literally be anything. Whatever the trait is, the episodic gene covers it up. Okay, same down here. Um, I, I, I'm a brown dog or I'm a black dog, but I got to ask, okay, is the episodic gene going to cover it up? And in this case, it doesn't matter. As long as you have one big E, it's the dominant trait for the episodic gene. According to our legend, that does not cover up uh, the second trait's phenotype. So these dogs are going to be allowed to be either brown or black. So the only time. Uh, for our epistatic examples here, um, you're going to have uh, the epistatic gene actually cover the phenotype of the other trait is if you have lowercase e, lowercase e, or homozygous recessive. Okay, complement interaction. So let's put epistatic uh, interaction aside for a second. Complementary interaction is a little bit different. So with complementary interaction, we... Um, are going to see two genotypes combine to create a phenotype that neither of those genotypes would have been able to produce by themselves. So A plus B is going to make C, okay? Um, something totally different than neither would have shown itself. So genotype A plus genotype B is going to make a totally different phenotypic outcome C. You wouldn't have predicted it, though, from the first two. You wouldn't have seen that normally. So let's take a look. Um, chicken's common example, you know, the moment for this stuff. So chicken example, um, here's four options. Um, 
if as long as it has a big R little P's, it's what we call the rose comb uh, neck head, I guess, of the chicken. So there you go. Looks like that. Um, little r, little r, big P is going to be P comb. Okay, so P is going to look like this. Its head shape is going to look like that. It's P comb. There is its genotype. The blank here means that it could be any other letter. It could, this top one here could have been big R, big R, little p, little p, or it could have been big R, little r, big p, or little p, little p, right? Or this could have been a big P in this blank, or this could have been a little p. It doesn't matter. As long as it's got one big P, boom, P comb. As long as it has those two little r's. To be a walnut-shaped head, as long as you have one big R and one big P, the second alleles for each don't matter, you're going to be a walnut-shaped head. Um, and then the last one here, if you have a single comb, you look like that. This guy looks pretty cool. It's faux hawk on his chicken head. Um, there's only one option for that. you got to be recessive for the R and recessive for the P. Okay, so there's our legend. Hold on to that for a second. Let's cruise. So here's some examples. Let's say I crossed... Uh, big R, big R, little P, little P, rose comb chicken with a little R, little R, big P, big P, P comb chicken. What would I get? Well, you do your cross, you got to foil that, foil that, do your Punnett square. You're going to have some multiple gametes that you can eliminate for crossing out like I showed you in the last video. And you'll get uh, all walnut heads and they'll all be heterozygous for both traits. If you were to cross two of those, it's a heterozygote with a heterozygote. Uh, big R, little R, big P, little P, that's going to be, no matter what, a big 16 bo uh, box square, a 4x4. Four four. You can't eliminate anything when you cross a heterozygote for both traits with a heterozygote for both traits. So you're going to have that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. And then here that is, and it kind of breaks it down for you. Go ahead, pause that if you need to. Try doing the crosses yourself. I would highly encourage you to pause this video here and do this cross, the heterozygote with the heterozygote, foil it, and then complete the cross. And make sure you can identify who's got the nine dominant for both, who's got the three, who's got the three, and who's got the one in your big square. Okay, good practice from the last video. So walnut, rose, pea, and single are phenotypes. Okay, let's do a question. Let's say we crossed uh, these two parents. Big R, big R, little P, little P, little R, little R, little big P, big P. So pretty much what we just saw in the last picture, actually. Um, the gametes, you could narrow them down, right? Wouldn't have to be a big 16 box square because they're going to double up. Foil your gametes. All of your offspring would be big R, little R, big P, little P. So heterozygous for both traits. You could probably guess the next question. Um, What's the cross that going to look like? This is what I just asked you to pause the video and do. Um, so you can check your answer here. Or if you didn't pause it before, chance number two. Pause the video here. Try doing this cross. Heterozygote for both traits. Cross with a heterozygote for both traits. Foil this. You can't eliminate any. They're all going to go down here. Foil that. You can't eliminate any. They're all going to go up at the top. Um, you don't have to do it twice because what you foil for this is going to be the same for both, right? Because it's the same organism or same genotype for both. So I'm going to do that. Let's say I foiled the first guy. There he is. Foiled the second guy. There he is. Two chickens, heterozygote for both traits. What are their offspring going to look like potentially? Top down, left in, write your dominant first. Keep your alleles together. So R's are going to stay together. P's are going to stay together. Boom. So there's the answers. Notice my coloring for you. Whenever you have a heterozygote with a heterozygote, you are always going to have a 16 box square and you're always, well, I put a little asterisk by that, hang tight, I'll tell you why in a second, but usually always, you're going to have a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio, where 9 all show one phenotype, 3 the green ones here show a different phenotype, dominant for one trait, recessive for the second trait, and then three are going to show opposite, dominant for the other trait, recessive for the opposite trait, and then only one is going to be recessive for both traits. All are different phenotypes. So nine to three to three to one. Um, great review from the last video that I posted regarding dihybrid crosses. 
Um, right? Anytime you have polygenic inheritance, safe to say two genes combining to form something that you couldn't see before. Um, just to blow your mind a little bit here, uh, polygenic inheritance in uh, uh, these birds here are going to be uh, quite variable, like huge numbers of different options of, uh, of feather colors in these parakeets, which is uh, neat. Don't don't please don't do these this is just to show you how how absolutely amazing you, uh, a variety you can have thanks to polygenic interaction right when you have one trait and another trait mixing to produce a totally novel third phenotype right much like our chicken heads um, or feather color or coat color you can really see why there's such a variation in height in humans or eye color in humans or hair color in humans, right? You're not just uh, black haired or blonde haired, you have every other combination in between those, and that's partly due to polygenic interaction. Um, I did say just two seconds ago that usually, if you don't mind me just tossing back here, usually you're gonna see this nine to three to three to one ratio. I have seen questions before though where you'll expect a nine to three to three to one ratio because it's heterozygote crossed with a heterozygote, Right? You think, I know how to do this, why wouldn't it be? Um, but, unfortunately, they could kind of throw you for a hoop here because what if they said, um, if it was this certain genotype, um, let's say big R, big R, little p, little p, for example, that's a lethal allele, right? So we're just combining two topics here now. What if they said, hey, do this heterozygote by heterozygote cross, it's really big cross, but I'm going to give you a little detail here and say, oh, one of those is a lethal allele. And they'll probably tell you which one it is, right? Which genotype it is. Well, then you, when the, if they were asking, well, how many uh, with uh, this particular genotype and phenotype will you have? Well, technically, you wouldn't count the organism that dies due to the lethal allele. So something to keep in mind. Um, I, I believe there's a question in your book um, that shows that. And so... Uh, I'll try and find it and then, and then link it to our Google Classroom or below in this video. But regardless, you could have a question where they said, hey, here's a cross, but remember, hey, there's this lethal allele. Here's the genotype that'll show that. You just got to remember before you answer your question, okay, where's my lethal allele? How many show that lethal allele as an expression phenotypically, aka how many die? And then don't count those in your final phenotype ratio count. Okay, uh, dominant complementary genes. Um, let's say I got flowers. Um, purple flowers, uh, showing peas, uh, require the presence of a big C and a big P. So if I have a big C and a big P, I'm going to be purple. Any other genotypic combination is going to make a white flower. So if you have a one big C and one big P, no matter what, uh, you'll have a purple flower. If you have anything other than one big C and one big P, you are going to be white. So let's see what that cross looks like. So chances of getting an offspring with a white flower from a cross between big C, big C, big P, little P, and a plant that's big C, sorry, little C, little C, big P, big, little P. So here's my legend, right? If it has one big C and one big P, it's gonna be purple or violet. If there's any other combination of uh, the genotype, it'll be a white flower. So I'm going to do my cross according to what it just told me. Remember, foil that first outside, inside, last. Do it for this organism, then do it for this organism. Okay, I foiled this. Don't do an unnecessarily large square if you don't have to. Those are all the same gametes. You don't need to include them all. Get rid of the ones that duplicate, like double up. All three of those are the same. Oh, I'm sorry. I, two of them are the same, right? One, one big... C, one big P, there's two of them. Get rid of one of them. One big C and a little P, there's two of them. Get rid of one of them. Um, guys, remember I said if you're using horrible letters like C's or P's or S's, um, try to avoid them if you can. But if a question sets it up and it's using these horrible questions, try to differentiate your big letters from your lowercase letters, right? So what I like to do, right, is I write the if I was writing this out on paper, I would write my lowercase letters with a little line on the top, right? So I'll just kind of show you on my my screen here. But I'll so if I was gonna write like 
a big C and a little c, my lowercase c, let me see if you can see that here, my lowercase c I draw with a line on the top just so that I know when I'm writing down a big square, potentially with a lot of letters, the difference between my capital S and my lowercase s, or my capital C or my lowercase c. Um, okay, so second guy here, uh, all of those uh, are not the same, right? Don't want to mix up my letters here. Two of these are the same, cross out one of them, it's redundant to keep both. Two of these are the same, cross out one of them, it's redundant to keep both. Boom, two by two, nothing crazy. I could have kept all four gametes for both, but why? My square is gonna be big for no reason. My phenotypic and genotypic ratios are going to be the same. Get rid of your redundant gametes if you can by crossing out duplicates. Fill it in, top down, left in, Top down, left in, top down, left in, top down, left in. Um, remember, anything with one big C and one big P is going to be purple or violet, according to our legend and the question. So big C, big P, one big C, one big P at least, one big C, one big P at least, purple, purple, purple. If it has anything other than one big C and at least one big P, like this one does not, right? It's not going to be purple or violet, it's going to be white. So... What's the question's asking, hey, what are the chances of getting an offspring with a white flower? Well, in this cross, it's one out of four, or in other words, 25%. They did very specifically say they want your answer to two decimal places, so they don't want the percentage, don't give a whole number 25%, they want a decimal chance, so 0 0.25. This was a numerical response question, be sure to bubble in the decimal, not the whole number percentage. Okay, pleiotropic genes, um, a single gene which has multiple effects. So pleo means many, tropic, um, think uh, like literally uh, effect, like it's got an entire effect over the body in terms of its phenotypic trait. And so these are genes that have many different trait, like phenotypic trait effects. Um, and they can affect things across the entire body. And so an example of this would be sickle cell anemia. Um, sickle cell anemia is a genetic mutation. It can lead to weakness, general fatigue. Uh, you have an enlarged spleen because your spleen's trying to uh, clean the blood cells that are irregularly shaped, and so it starts to swell as, as blockages are occurring due to these irregularly shaped red blood cells caused by sickle cell anemia. Right? It's called sickle cell because we they're shaped like a sickle because they're they're hardened red blood cells. They're no longer biconcave. They're they're shaped oddly, curved like a sickle knife thing, right? And they're they're hard usually, so like pack and clog arteries and veins and organs. Um, so they can cause a huge amount of systemic issues throughout the body. Um, so there's some sickle cells in our real blood smear for you. Regular cell, sickle cell. Um, they don't carry oxygen very well, and like I said, they get stuck. They're hard. They're not flexible, and so um, here's a little transcription translation here for you. Just a quick review, but basically, you've got sickle cell due to a mutation, right? A point mutation, let's say. And so, pleiotropic genes are genes that, like I said, cause drastic effects on more than one trait. Um, so sickle cell anemia is a good example of a pleiotropic gene because it affects spleen and fatigue and oxygen carrying and, and, and general health across the body. Um, Marfan syndrome is the inability to produce connective tissue. Um, it's, a, it's a terrifying disease uh, or syndrome, if you will, um, because like the connective tissue that's holding ligaments and bones and muscles together, um, giving you the structure, flexibility, motion, right, um, isn't there in the way that it should be. And so individuals with Marfan syndrome, and I, like this picture shows it really well. I mean, look at their hands, right? Like you just don't have the, the motor control. Um, you don't have the, like even their shoulders, their chest, right? Like everything's just out in front of them because they, they don't have that connective tissue. Well, it's a, caused by a pleiotropic gene. Um, it doesn't just affect their bones and hands. It's going to affect anything with muscle connected to other things because that's where connective tissue comes in. So your eyes, right? 
your eyes have connective tissue that helps them move and rotate in all the ways you rotate them, irises and everything moving, blinking, motion, right? Um, you lack connective tissue in Marfan syndrome. That trait is affecting eyes, skeletal system, your heart and your blood vessels. Remember, talk about blood in bio 20, right? You've got valves, you've got uh, muscles pushing on veins in your legs, you, which are attached to connective tissue. You've got uh, your heart, right? All the fibers and muscles that are holding your heart and, and, and when you compress through the electrical stimulation and it's pushing those muscles together, again, muscles and those sinoatrial nodes like your, your, uh, your SA valve and your, all your valves of your heart when they're opening and closing, that's connective tissue holding them together and sealing them nice and tight and loosening them up, sealing them nice and tight. You're going to have a lot of issues. So again, pleiotropic. Um, it's causing an effect throughout the entire body. Classic example outside of the two we just talked about is a disease called PKU. Um, this disease comes up on the diploma and unit exams all the time. Uh, and it's a disease that can cause uh, uh, mental slowing, uh, reduced hair uh, creation, sp skin pigmentation can change. Um, and so it's uh, mutations on a single gene, but they can affect many, 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 many traits throughout the entire body. Again, that's the definition of pleiotropic gene. One gene, mutation or otherwise, that causes an, a, a wide acting effect on the body. Many body systems get affected by it. So it's not just one trait that gets affected, it's many traits that get affected. So PKU, just to show you the, the list of possible symptoms from one gene, the pleiotropy of this gene, hyperactivity, stunted growth, rashes, small head size, musty odor in their breath, in their urine, they, even their skin smells weird. Um, they have lighter skin due to the lack of pigmentation, lack of pigmentation in the retina, so they're typically a bluer, grayer kind of color. Um, social problems, right? Uh, cognitive delays, many traits affected by one gene. PKU is a great example of a pleiotropic gene. Marfan syndrome was another example. Uh, sickle cell anemia was another example. Okay. Um, here's just a little explanation. You can pause the video here if you want to learn more about PKU. Um, it's just a base pairing mutation, point mutation. Uh, remember that, and this is backing it up a little bit, but traits are always going to be a 50-50 uh, relation between your environment and your genetics, okay? Nurture versus nature, that, that classic question. Um, and so if, for example, you took a flower, and a primrose flower, and if you raise it in room temperature, it's going to be red. If you raise it in anything above 30 degrees Celsius, it's white. Now, there might be a lot of reasons for this, right? Like maybe that flower, when it's at nice, cool, 20-something degrees Celsius, it's got more than enough energy and able to function normally. It can create these beautiful pigments in its flowers and be vividly red. Maybe when you stress the plant, it doesn't have as much metabolic freedom because um, it's struggling to stay, stay alive due to the increased temperatures. Its traits change. I mean, it's no different than if you took two twins or something, let's say, and you um, uh, raise them totally differently, right? Let's say you're identical twins, you raise them totally differently. One twin got good amount of sleep, healthy nutrition growing up, uh, proper education. You love the crap out of them as they were growing up. So they got a lot of positive social interaction. They're going to end up being a very different individual phenotypically, right? Than somebody who from, a, from childhood lacked sleep, lacked proper nutrition, uh, was isolated from peers, um, didn't have a lot of parental interaction, right? They're going to show phenotypic traits that are very different from that other twin. Their genetics should be, because they're identical, uh, exactly the same. So their genotypes should be the same, but the expression of their phenotypes could be drastically different. And there's that nurture versus nature. And I'm going to say this right now, it's pretty safe to say that every trait that you possess is contributed 50% due to your genetics and 50% due to your uh, environment. Nurture versus nature. It's not just one versus the other. One guides the other. So your genetics might show a, a window of where you can reach. And then your um, 
actual phenotypes so where you land in that window is going to be based off of your uh, environment right so you might have the genetics to be anywhere between five foot eight and six foot eight but then you might have had an environmental uh, factors growing up where you got a certain amount of sleep or lack thereof or a certain amount of nutrition or lack thereof or a certain amount of milk let's say or lack thereof and and then based off of that even though you could have been anywhere your genetics said you could have been between five eight and six eight um you might have landed somewhere around six foot right you're fairly tall not as tall as your genetics could have let you be because maybe you had a great great grandfather that was like six foot five six foot six you didn't land quite there even you even though you had the genes for it because of your nurture versus nature um so we got lots of options here right you don't have to have wrinkles but if you're always in the sun or you're smoking, you're going to have wrinkles, nurture versus nature. Environment is going to play a role, no matter what. Environment's always going to play a role. Some stuff here on smoking, right? That's an environmental factor. It's going to play a role. Mom, might, mom and dad might have great skin. You smoke your whole life, which is bad. Uh, you're going to have wrinkles, nurture versus nature. You might have had the genetics for nice skin, but your environment uh, changed that phenotype, right? So there's an example of what I meant by two identical twins, raise them very differently, and you might have very different phenotypic outcomes. Nurture versus nature, 50% each is usually what we'll say. The genetics will guide where you can be from sort of max to min on a, on a scale of a trait, and then your environment will tell you where you land um, ultimately on that scale. Okay, so... Uh, that's video number two on dihybrid crosses, focused on epistatic interaction, polygenic inheritance, lethal genes, nurture versus nature. Um, so rewatch this video, rewatch the last one if you have some trouble with the heterozygote, cross with a heterozygote, big 16 by 16 square. Um, the next video we're going to focus on is going to be on uh, sex linkage. So we're going to do topic four in my third video here, and we're going to talk about sex linkage. So that'll be titled uh, topic four sex linkage, Mendelian genetics. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email.